Thank you for the introduction and also for the really good talks before mine. So I have a quite easy job now because a lot of useful information was provided through the raw material, both the raw material context and also for autonomy and uh, robotic exploration in mines. So I would not, uh, I will not go into details of the project because this is why we have the afternoon for special sessions for robotics and geology. So I'd like to connect these two with my talk. <coughs> So, what was the idea behind the, the Unix Win project? So, try to build a system which can enter into such a dangerous environment we saw in an earlier uh, presentation of uh, 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 Helmut. And uh, so, we'd like to send autonomous robots to a flooded underground environment to deliver 3D maps. And 3D maps and visual is already very useful, but even if we can deliver some information about geology, about the rocks, about the minerals, still available there. The key numbers are, uh, can be seen in this slide. So we started with 13 partners, finished with 12. And we are getting the end of the project. The project we landed in October and was founded by a, uh, founded with a 4.9 million euros. And what we like, uh, promised to create, and we are quite successful on that, to build a working prototype robots and establish a company who go who takes further this technology and offering the, the service. So why we need to assess uh, abandoned flooded mines? Because um, those mines are not completely empty. We have a lot because we have a mining history in Europe. And as we heard, they, they could be uh, reopened if uh, there are commodities. It is two ways. One, uh, to mine the same commodity, and uh, usually a mine is not closed because it's completely empty. It's not like a, a food storage. You open it, takes your last can of food, and there's nothing remaining. There's a cutoff grade. There is an economical grade when you stop mining, and that grade is changing. That grade is changing with the time, the price of the. Uh, commodity and also with technology. Uh, for example, uh, copper. 30 years ago there was a cutoff grade of 1% of copper. Then uh, extraction technology changed and also the, the need for copper uh, increased. So the prices went up really high, uh, high so the cutoff now we are facing it's 0.4, in special cases 0.2%. So between the 1%, if the mine was shut down 30 years ago, there could be huge uh, reserves which are uh, economically could be mined. And the other way is when the byproducts, or even not byproducts, but uh, that time when the mine was closed, it could be considered waste. One of our locations, you have the map here, the Ecton mine is a copper mine, but with a, with a, um, uh, the copper is together with the fluoride, with the, that type of uh, ore mineralization. And when the mine was shut down 150, 160 years ago, fluoride was considered waste and even thrown away to the waste dumps. Now, not now, but even in the first list, critical raw materials, fluoride is there. So maybe you will reopen the mine for a completely different commodity, which was not even uh, met that time when, uh, when the mine was operational. So there, was, there is no proper information uh, what is there. So this is why we have to go back and reassess mines from time to time 
and decide if it's worth to reopen or not. The Unix in consortium is visible here. I separate it in three pillars and this is why it gives a really healthy balance of the consortium. The first five groups are mainly working on the technological side. So they are the technology developers, University of Mishkoz is leading the project, Tampere University, sorry about that, they changed the name this year, now they are just Tampere University, and the, uh, the Technical University of uh, Madrid, and Ines Tech in Porto, and uh, uh, RCI from the UK, who are really building the robot. The other guys uh, focus on technology exploitation, dissemination, uh, which is uh, led by La Palma Research Center, Geological uh, Survey of Slovenia, European Federation of Geologists, and uh, Geomontan uh, Limited. And the uh, last uh, three on the list are our key stakeholders, the, the owners of those mines which were, uh, which they uh, allowed us to test the technology, develop the technology. ADM from uh, Portugal owned the Urgerisa mine. Acton Mine Educational Trust is handling Acton, which was our main demonstration site this May. And uh, the, our last partner is Idria Heritage Mine, who is uh, taking care of um, 500 year old uh, Mercury. So the idea when we submitted the project was to build a robot which can assess flooded workings, even flooded medieval workings. In a modern mine you have a lot of space because you go, go there with machines, so two, three meter wide corridors. But when you have to remove the commodity by hand, then uh, uh, there could be there could be passages where only one human fits. This is where, and we measured the, the old mines, and we came up with this 60 centimeter size robot. That was a, one of the biggest challenges: miniaturization during the project. Because uh, on the kickoff meeting, we we asked the partners, okay, who uh, responsible for the different. Uh, Aspect, uh, parts of the robot, what they'd like to put inside, what's the size, what's the weight, because we know if it's a 60 meter centimeter robot, we were aiming for spherical robot uh, to minimize uh, the possibility of stacking and able to, to turn in any kind of dangerous situation. If you have a 60 diameter ball, and must be neutral on the water, or close to neutral, you will end up with 110 kilos, 112 kilos. So that was a strict limitation. We have we four times time time bigger space and three times bigger weight. Three and a half years ago. And we had to build a robot in one and a half year, maximum two years. So those first two years were about really miniaturization and integration to able to fit everything inside. And of course, as we heard in the previous lecture, it has to take its energy, so power limitations also were uh, a very strict uh, thing because we cannot take hundreds of kilos of batteries, so 10-20% of batteries, 10-15 kilos of batteries must be. So we we're thinking about that 100, 300 watts. We made it a bit more. At the beginning, we didn't even know if a <coughs> spherical or if a robot is easily controllable or not, or how will it behave in a flooded environment. So, started with the, the computational test, then uh, had to survive the pressure, 500 meter with safety margin, everything must be designed up to 60 bars at least. And when uh, we were confident in a virtual reality environment, then we started to build models. It really works and it did. So this was the point when we started to produce the hull. And in the beginning we thought there are a lot of, uh, because we are not the first one in uh, uh, geological research in mind. So 
We can use a lot of uh, already developed equipment, but we face uh, problems with it. They were not designed for underwater, or even their size was a problematic for us. So a lot of special uh, tools, even light systems, or and uh, the 3D mapping system must be developed from scratch. We see here the structural light system, which is, I think, quite unique and very useful uh, for the environment. And then we had to test if these, uh, if these uh, um, sensors give enough useful information or how to run these sensors to cover properly what we need. So we went back to the uh, simulation and uh, when we were satisfied with the data and then we started uh, really real data. And as we said, not only wildlife and 3D mapping, but also try to deliver some geology, some information about the rocks. If it's uh, presented, uh, what, uh, what is there? So three main areas is there sample the water, do some geophysical measurements on the wall, or try some uh, mineralogical, uh, geochemical analysis. As it's being the first of its kind of this robot, it's very difficult to touch the wall, very dangerous to touch the wall. You touch the wall, maybe the roof will collapse on you. So this is, and also our locations, our unique locations, these are uh, cultural heritage places. As uh, Idria is being a UNESCO World Heritage Site, Acton Mine is being, uh, being a national monument, uh, we were not even allowed to drill a single hole to protect everything. So we decided to use a non-contact metal, a non-contact robot to keep far from the walls. Our next idea is to have some contact robots, have some sampling. And I really liked uh, uh, um, Helmut's slides a few minutes ago. There was a list at first, sensing something, then sample something, then have a manipulation device. And of course, we are in the beginning of the technology, we'd like to sense. And in the next, we'd like to have a sampling device and further, maybe, the manipulation. So we selected three areas and selected three, uh, some type of measurements which could be useful and, real, uh, and, and, and we are able to turn to reality in time, money, and uh, size-wise in the project. So much more methods can be there. We have a nice deliverable where we evaluated almost 40, uh, more than 40 different metals, how useful they are. So this is a, a short list we, we built for the robots. And of course, we started the integration. And the first part was from the beginning of the, uh, 2016 to 2018. So last spring, we started assembly of the robot. And uh, from uh, late spring, we had the, the field test. So after uh, very intense integration of the robots and uh, pool tests in, in, in the, in the Inestec laboratory in Porto, we went for our demonstrations. <coughs> Originally we had a five, uh, four demonstration site with uh, increasing uh, uh, difficulties which we faced with the robot. But finally we could uh, save some money and turn one of our uh, mid-term meeting into a field trial and at the Monariano field trial for two purposes. One was uh, to have access for horizontal tunnels. Usually a mine is going with a vertical shaft and then the horizontal parts. So it was a different type of uh, data collection <coughs> and uh, normally in a mine you have quite nice cuts uh, rectangular shape tunnels, but in a case of emergency or case in, the, in the hand, uh, handmade mining, there can be very unstructured environment with unique, uh, uh, unique uh, irregular shapes. And this is where the cave is coming from. Because those shapes 
uh, they are natural. <coughs> and uh, the, the last point we choose a uh, flooded mine, uh, uh, sorry, a flooded cave, because it's a water reservoir for a thermal <coughs> uh, for a spa in, in Budapest. So to prove that this is not just for raw material, but when you have the technology, it can be useful for in, in, in a lot of places, even in rescue. <coughs> So we had these five uh, demonstration sites where we were facing uh, uh, growing difficulties. The first one was uh, Pakela, which is an open pit uh, pegmatite mine with partial underground corridors, uh, but uh, easily accessible, regularly accessible by scuba divers. So this is why we tested here the robot, and this was the, the first place we went into confined places Underground, uh, underground environments, and you see here in, in your right uh, the, the test board with our minerals for uh, the multispectral image. After we faced the real mining condition in Idria, where we had to manage to transport the robot almost to 200 meter depth, 180 some meter. Partially available with elevator, but later by uh, only by uh, by winches and very limited and confined spaces were here, both for launching the robot and also for the robot. A lot of obstacles there. We had to maneuver in murky water because it's an it's an actively pumping the water there. Otherwise, the rest of the mine, even the surface, would be flooded because of the pumping we had bad visibility and basically we had to navigate in 1 meter by 1.2 meter with a 60 diameter, centimeter diameter robot. It was a really big challenge but we could manage to deliver three dimensional map of the available parts of the shaft and the first opening. Then we went to an abandoned uh, the uranium mine we had two missions on the field in UJ Risa, uh, close to Porto, where we had uh, access to the, the shafts and uh, we could map the entrances of three, uh, the first three levels. The first really deep dive happened here, below 100 meter, and this was the place where we could test the SLS, the structure life system, quite well with the visibility and integrated there. So you see somewhere in the bottom middle an acoustic map. But you can see the quality of the, your right top part by the, by, by the laser, how better is the resolution. And this is one thing to deliver the, the information of the sensors. And of course, even there are echoes, outliers, problems of the point. The human will understand where the wall is, but the robot not. not. So you have to transfer, uh, transfer these data to a real map of the robot that is properly filtered, and it is called optimal building. So what you see on the bottom uh, right side is the real-time optimal the robot is building itself. And the robot can understand those, uh, those cubes as obstacles and can be avoided uh, from, from that. And with the further, we went our most important uh, test site, Acton Mine, this way. And uh, with uh, three available uh, water surfaces, two shafts, and uh, one pipe system, we had a uh, lot of dives during uh, the, the test period and able to, to deliver. 3D maps and really new information. It's 160 years old. Uh, uh, the, the mine is much older, but the last operations were done 160 years ago. So we have no information uh, about that. We've been, we went there and we, I would say proudly, we made discoveries with unknown things. We discovered unknown corridors, connections, and, uh, and also how the shafts were blocked. So what is colored on the map? This this map is a 160-year-old map, and the parts which are uh, which are covered 
we were able to manage it. The two shafts are blocked 117 meter and 124 meter. So we couldn't fully cover that part. And our last mission was the Mona Janos Cape, which also tested the, the tolerance of the robot as it's being a thermal cave, so much warmer conditions. Actually, we're facing the warmest water right here in the moon, so I really hope it will work well this afternoon. But one thing to have the real time data after. If you want it really accurate, you have to you have to process it. So you have to store it and do a lot of corrections with the data and build a proper database. But of course, it's really huge. Uh, the robot is delivering one terabyte data in every hour if all the sensors are running. And then you have to process it. Even just a quick number about the uh, multispectral images. I can measure the wall, the mineralogy, uh, less than a half a second of uh, one square meter. If there's a millimeter resolution, it means one million spectrum. But if the robot travels on one kilometer, then multiply that one million with thousand. And then those data has to be processed. So this is where machine learning and uh, big data handling um, comes to picture. And of course, after that, this data must be visualized for humans to understand able to handle the data. And of course, the best one, if you do it in three dimension and in the virtual reality, where you can interact the data with a lot of autonomous functions, for example, with the different types, we have autonomously fallen, fallen rock recognition uh, part of uh, the software. So on the right top, you will see a green and red image, where the red image is the change between the two types. This data, it's not under, underwater data, it's above the water data of Acton, but uh, as a uh, Helmut said that it has to be monitoring the dangerous environment if it's changing. Autonomous rock falling uh, recognition software. Also an autonomous part of the inclination of the surface of the, of the environment. And hopefully you will see uh, these in the later talks in detail. And uh, about the exploitation. Because one thing to, to develop the machine, the other thing is to use that technology in the market, make it available for people. This is why we established Unix Ninja Robotics Company, who will take further the technology. And of course, the primary target is raw materials exploration, but I already mentioned two other ways, to, or, or three more ways to to use the technology as a whole. This list is a split into the top part where we offer the service directly with the full robot and the bottom list where we can utilize the technology partially. For example, if we have this fallen rock automation software, it cannot be used just for the Unix main purposes for under, uh, underwater. It can be used for any kind of uh, any kind of uh, mine services, regular inspection. But also, if you, we think about multispectral camera, which I'm measuring the wall from a moving robot. If I put the equipment on top of a conveyor belt, and my instrument is standing and the material is moving under it, I will I, I, I'm capable to do the same mineral recognition on a conveyor belt with this uh, equipment. And as it was heard earlier, we are quite proud to have a follow-up project with EIT raw materials <coughs> where we'd like to further develop this technology. <coughs> what we learned here to really take closer to the market and stabilize what we have. So 
this is what I wanted to show. I don't know if I have three more minutes or <coughs> I finish my time. How it's going? Because if it's possible, I'd like to have a three minutes video about the project and you can see some. As our life requires more and more raw materials, we have to search for new ways to find them. One of the options is to reassess old mines, and as most of them are flooded, to carry out safe and cost-effective surveys, serious technological innovations are needed. The Unexmin team has been set up to develop an autonomous robot solution capable of operating without remote control, as deep as 500 meters underwater. This is the UX-1, which will autonomously map the abandoned, flooded mines and gather valuable geological and mineralogical information. The scientific instrumentation is developed at the University of Mishkots. The robot should be able to identify all the potentially interesting minerals under the harshest conditions. If engineers could manage to deliver all these devices to the right spots of the flooded mines, geologists could decide if it is worthwhile restarting a more detailed exploration. Researchers at the Inesctech Laboratory of Robotics and Autonomous Systems in Porto design and manufacture robots capable of self-orientation and autonomous decision-making. The UX-1 builds up a real-time 3D model of its environment by analyzing and combining flow meter, sonar, laser beam, and accelerometer information. No wonder, it looks like a spaceship from a science fiction movie. Eight propellers are mounted on the robot for propulsion. Each can work independently and in both directions. The University of Tampere is designing the mechanics. Scientists choose an abandoned quarry as a testing location. Finland is a perfect place for such a test. This time of year, the sun never goes down. The UX-1 has to prove itself in challenging sites, like Ujarisa in Portugal, the Idria mercury mine in Slovenia, and at Ecton mine in the United Kingdom. The deep shafts and the historical mystery make Ecton a perfect test site for the Unexmin project. The surface team in the control room is eagerly watching the transferred data of all types. Artificial tunnels are planned and built in an orderly fashion, but in a cave, UX-1 has to face a more irregular terrain. The Molnar Janos cave, the largest underwater hydrothermal cave in Europe, lies under Budapest, the capital of Hungary. The aim of the UNEXMIN team during the test dives in Budapest is to fine-tune the navigational skills of the UX-1 in the challenging, complex environment. As the first dives of the UX-1 went fine, now is the time to shed light on murky mines.